All right, listeners, I think you know that we are part of the Radiotopia Network, which is basically a network built on the idea that you should support the most creative, independent audio makers around. No one, and I mean no one, embodies the Radiotopia ethos more than Benjamin Walker and his show, Theory of Everything. Benjamin, who I've known for a long time, has been making beautiful, personal, sprawling audio documentaries for decades that help us understand the very strange world we live in. And now he has a new series called Not All Propaganda is Art. The new series goes back to the 1950s when Western security agencies like the CIA paid artists, writers, and intellectuals to fight the cultural Cold War. The CIA funds were free. I mean, no one was told what to say. Gloria Steinem, activist who sees the CIA as a sort of enlightened pal or rich uncle, there is another viewpoint. Look, if you're listening to this show, I know you like secret histories. I know you like a mix of culture and politics and shadowy figures. So what are you waiting for? Not All Propaganda is Art from Benjamin Walker. You can find it now wherever you listen or at theoryofeverythingpodcast.com. Hey everyone, Jody Abergan here. It is October of an even-numbered year, which means that our minds turn to the election in early November. All this month, we are going to be doing special episodes still about history, but ones that feel like they might speak to the run-up to this year's very important election. This week, we're going to re-air a few of our favorites, and then we're going to do special theme weeks on polling, referendums, midterm elections, right up to Election Day. So that's the plan. Happy October. Here we go with one of our favorite midterm related stories from the archives. Hello and welcome to This Day in Esoteric Political History from Radiotopia. My name is Jody Avergan. This day, November 16th, 2010, 14 days after the 2010 election day, Alaska's Republican Senator Lisa Murkowski finally surpassed fellow Republican Joe Miller in the vote count in their bid for the Senate seat. Okay, that's fine. Our senator wins re-election. It's a close race. That doesn't seem that special. But the very weird thing about Murkowski's win, which she ended up winning by just about 1,500 votes, is that she was not on the ballot. Murkowski had lost the primary and decided to launch a write-in campaign in the general election. So some 92,000 people did indeed write in Murkowski's name, and she was re-elected. It was the first write-in Senate victory since 1954, and the last in a long time until actually this year there was a sort of notable write-in campaign but it was uniquely Alaskan in that it involved Sarah Palin and the late Senator Ted Stevens but I think it also shows in a very interesting way how a party has to navigate the primary process and navigate frankly the some of the fringe elements of its party which I think has a lot to make us think about today. So here to discuss and think about that are as always Nicole Hemmer of Columbia and Kelly Carter Jackson of Wellesley. Hello there. Hello, Jody. Hey there. Uh, we'll get into the specifics, but a writing campaign on a tactical level <laughs> is pretty hard to pull off, right, Kelly? Can I just say it's hard to pull off because it's like it's not like she's like Lisa Smith or Lisa yes. Jones. <laughs> <laughs> this is Lisa Murkowski, <laughs> like, and you can botch the spelling of that name in so many different ways. <laughs> like it's pretty impressive, <laughs> yeah, to say the least. But you're allowed to misspell a little bit, right? I mean, it's very interesting, right? It's like there's a genuine sort of like uh, figuring out what 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 someone was trying to write in is can be a very tricky process. And that was actually something that got sorted out in the courts beforehand. That there was you didn't have to strictly correctly spell her last name, which was going to be really important. Although we should say, like most Alaskans were very familiar with the last name Murkowski. Her dad had been the senator. She actually was given his Senate seat when he retired midterm, when he went to go become the governor. So Murkowski is almost a a royal name in Alaska. (laughs) Yeah, so if there's one one complicated name they could could, um, spell, it's that one. But, you know, it it puts a burden on election officials who have to basically go through and validate each one and say, okay, what, what was the intent here? And then there's also along the margins, there's probably some litigation and back and forth and some contesting of the ballots saying, you know, this is this was really spelled poorly. Maybe they were trying to you know, <laughs> someone else. Um, but uh, there are other techniques that you can use to mount a successful writing campaign, right? 
Heck yeah, you can use a stamp. How okay. cool is that? So lately, especially, stamps have been all the rage when it comes to writing campaigns because, well, well for one, you don't have to worry about misspelling. But if you can, you know, purchase enough stamps and then disseminate them out to all of your your voters and and fans and followers um it makes it pretty easy to go into the ballot booth and stamp for the person that you want yeah and there's a certain novelty to that too yeah (laughs) right um i yeah i don't know what to make of the stamp thing i suppose it's um uh, you know it certainly makes it more efficient to do a writing campaign i have this notion of someone really being sneaky about swapping in a different stamp right and saying oh this is a Murkowski stamp and then it's actually someone else stamp I mean that's the way that's the like that's the sneak in campaign underneath the write-in campaign but um that's any political strategist out there listening can take that tip and, and run with it and see if you can pull it off um but you know to state the obvious a lot of people go into the ballot booth and they just vote their party right and so the, mm-hmm. the fact that Miller is on the ticket as the GOP candidate is a huge advantage. And so even with Murkowski's name recognition and, you know, pretty quickly after the primary announcing, you know what, I'm going to mount a writing campaign um, and having a lot of establishment backing, even even with all that, it's a huge hurdle to overcome just simply not being on the ballot. Yeah, absolutely. And it speaks to how how much attention this race was getting that, you know, 92,000 people take the time to write her name in, which means they understood the intricacies of what they were being asked to do. They couldn't vote straight party line tickets. They had to be attentive enough to make this happen. It, it suggests a real level of engagement that we don't often think about with elections. So let's take half a step back and talk about how we get into this situation to begin with. Um, This is all because Miller wins the primary over McCaskey, a big upset. But in 2010, big upsets in the GOP at the primary is not that unique of a thing because 2010, absolute height of Tea Party season. Yeah. Yeah. And Miller is pretty much a Tea Party favorite. He gets backed by You know, former governor at the time, Sarah Palin, um, the former governor, Mike Huckabee of Arkansas. I mean, he had um, a lot of momentum behind him. And I think in a way that, you know, um, showed that he might have an easier path toward victory than Lisa Murkowski would. But it's, it's interesting how, you know, his support for like states' rights and tax and spending cuts, it resonated with a lot of people. So he, he had a base to draw from. That's for sure. And there was this kind of throw the bums out spirit, right, that you were striking back at the Republican establishment. And he had every reason to believe that if he won the nomination in the primary, he was going to win this. Nobody ever talks about Scott McAdams, who is the Democrat who won the nomination, um, because nobody thought that a Democrat was going to be able to win this Senate seat. So it was supposed to be an easy ride to victory. But as we saw again and again in places where Tea Party outsiders overthrew established candidates, sometimes those Tea Party political neophytes were not ready for prime time, and it really yeah. upended a lot of races. Who was in O'Donnell in Delaware? That's a future O'Donnell episode. O'Donnell in Delaware, yep. She had, which, you know. Sharon Engel in Nevada. There's yeah, a lot of future yeah. episodes in this topic. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, obviously Sarah Palin in 2008 – um, was when she was the vice presidential candidate. Nikki, just give us a sense of like what her standing uh, as a lar- you know political figure um, is by 2010. She still has enough juice to help propel Miller. Oh, absolutely. So Sarah Palin had been plucked from obscurity. I mean, she was the governor of Alaska, but most people didn't know who the governor of Alaska was when she was um, named as John McCain's running mate. But she electrified the conservative base during that campaign. And she pretty openly struggled with uh, with McCain's consultants and advisors and McCain himself. And so she became the embodiment of this new politician who was taking aim at the Republican establishment. So she went back to Alaska and she served as governor for a little while and then she quit um, and would go on to become like a Fox News talking head. She wrote her memoir, Going Rogue. um, And 
by 2010, she's kind of the face of the Tea Party. She speaks at the first Tea Party convention, and then she starts endorsing candidates. And so she becomes kind of this litmus test for how well the Tea Party is doing and how much political sway she still has. Because a lot of people were already talking about her as a presidential candidate in 2012. Yeah. Um, There's this larger context of establishment versus Tea Party, and it is playing out in just really sort of stark ways within Alaska as well, because you have Sarah Palin and then Murkowski, obviously, as we're describing legacy, but not only just Murkowski, but she has this legacy of Ted Stevens, longtime Mm -hmm. Republican senator from Alaska who had died in a plane crash earlier Mm -hmm. that year. Um, Someone actually sent us an email asking us to do a episode about the history of plane crashes in Alaska, which of which there are many because that's how you get around in Alaska is on these yeah. small planes. And so a lot of politicians have, have been in plane crashes. And Ted Stevens had died earlier that year, um, beloved figure, and someone who had kind of endorsed Murkowski. And Murkowski kind of picks up the legacy of Stevens, but also has to walk mm-hmm. this, this interesting line because obviously he had just died and she didn't want to be seen as exploiting his yeah. His memory. She, I think she made a smart call to not uh, run the commercial that he did endorsing her because she could have easily said, oh, yeah, we're going to run this commercial and, you know, let it let it remind people that he endorsed me. But thankfully, I think she took a more careful and, and sensitive approach. But people still knew that that was, you know, her mentor and that they had this relationship and that he was supportive of her. Um, and I think that that tragedy and that memory also propelled a lot of people to go into that ballot booth and, and, you know, write in her name. She also has this amazing line when she announces her writing candidacy where she says that Republicans deserve at least one woman who won't quit on them, which was yeah. such a burn against Sarah Palin. We certainly are, you know, focusing on Murkowski's successful campaign as write in. I think Miller also, as we were hinting at, you know, not really ready for prime time. He has a bunch of ethics scandals which come out. There's stories that he had like handcuffed his he had private security at handcuffed journalists. Um he says some line where he like praises the East Germany border p- control policy or something. I mean there's just, you know the the lights are shining bright and it's not looking so good for Miller and he's feeling the pressure and you know he actually at one point drops to third which I guess we haven't mentioned yes but there is a Democrat in this race but I think it's you know Alaska is a pretty red state at that point um that said Murkowski wins with 39 percent of the vote I mean in a three-way race you know that's just about even um she 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 ekes out it's like 39 36 30 I don't know whatever but um so uh it's not like she blows Miller away, but nevertheless, a, a pretty big accomplishment. And and as we said in the intro, it takes two weeks to kind of sift through. And again, it's um, it's a very, very tight margin by the end. Does this also show that Sarah Palin is not necessarily the kingmaker that she thought she would be, you know, by <laughs> in being able to like say, oh, I'm going to endorse these Tea Party candidates and then they lose. Well, maybe you don't have the cash <laughs> that you think you do. Yeah. And doesn't have yeah. the cachet in her home state of Alaska. Yeah. Um, which is a yeah. pretty, that's the, pretty weak that's position the to real be in. real burn, right? <laughs> yeah. It's not right. that, like, you couldn't pull it off in Nevada or whatever. You can't pull it off in your own home state. That's a problem. Right. And we'll we'll do some Sarah Palin episodes. But, I mean, I think the probably next stop for her after this is it's pretty quickly to reality TV for her um, after this. So, yes. Sarah um, Palin's America, folks. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I want to do. I do want to end a little bit with some thoughts on, you know, this as a story that shows that it is possible for a party to reject or moderate or whatever, even after it kind of like steps in it, um, to to moderate and reject the sort of fringer elements of its of its party. And um, 2010 is not that long ago. A lot of the same forces are still out there, but it seems like. The GOP, at least, um, has lost the ability in many ways to moderate. But I think this is a lesson in the fact that you still can you still can do that. Well, I mean, it, the underscoring that the GOP was forced to moderate because when Joe Miller won the nomination, everyone from Mitch McConnell on down supported him and told Murkowski not to run her write-in campaign. Um, And it was the voters who sent Murkowski back to Congress. And so it's not just about the party leadership asserting itself. It's the voters. Right. 
Right. And and maybe it's a unique scenario in which Murkowski knows she has such name recognition and is beloved that she's not going to like feel the wrath in a way that someone now might if they try and cross the big red Donald Trump line. Um, yeah. Yeah, certainly. Um, OK. Well, that brings us to the end of the episode. Um, we've got, I should have said we've gotten a number of requests to do this write-in vote for Murkowski, so thank you to everyone who, who requested it, and keep those coming. We really love doing episodes that are suggested by listeners, so you can email us, thisdaypod at gmail.com. Their own Nicole writing Hammer. campaign. There you go. Yeah, writing, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Just make sure you spell everything correctly or use a rubber stamp. Uh, okay. Nicole Hammer, thanks to you. Thank you, Jody. And Kelly Carter-Jackson, thanks to you. My pleasure. Harry, this was a huge uphill battle for Lisa Murkowski, who was urged by Republican leaders not to wage this campaign after she lost her primary bid. She had to convince Alaska voters to write in her name in huge numbers, and it appears she was successful.